folks, welcome back for another Feature Friday. I'm your host, Ryan Glover, and this week we're going to be learning how to build an infinite scroll. So one of the features that I've been kind of holding off on inside of Command, the upcoming SaaS product from Clever Beagle, is adding infinite scroll to the cards list as well as the versions list. And this is something that I, I have a few things kind of stashed away to help me do this, but it's, it's the type of work that I usually save till the end. So it's not really a, a feature that's totally necessary to have, but it does add a bit of polish to the product. So what we're gonna do today is take a look at how I've implemented infinite scroll in respect to the card UI inside of Command. So I'm not gonna really pussyfoot around on this one, we're just gonna jump into it. So if you're ready, let's get started. In order to avoid wasting any time here, what I've done is I've gone ahead and already implemented infinite scroll. So what we're gonna do is walk through my implementation. So to get us started, what I wanna do is take a look at what this looks like in the browser. So what we'll see is it's pretty much what we'd expect. Here in the cards list in command for a product, if I scroll, we'll notice that as I go, cards keep being added to the list. And we can see the scroll bar over on the right kind of jumps a little bit when I hit the bottom of my list. Pretty basic stuff. There's not really much in terms of the visuals of this. It's, it, it's one of those things that either works or it doesn't. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump over to the code and take a look at how this is working. And in terms of the code, where I wanna start is explaining how I go about building something like this. So you'll notice that if I refresh this page here and we'll just keep scrolling, there is a ton of data in here and Hopefully you've, you've kind of thought this one through and you're like, he didn't really type all that in. It's like, of course I didn't. Um, and so this is something that I tend to do when I'm doing an infinite scroll feature or anything that just requires me to test a, with a lot of data. So that could be uh, just a simple UI thing that I want to test out or it could be a performance thing. Um, and so what I've done behind the scenes is um, in any product that I'm working on, my own or you know, with uh, one of the mentees at Clever Beagle, one of the things that I really push to do is have really solid fixture data. And so inside of Command, one of the things that I did early on in the project is spent probably a day or two just focused on implementing fixtures. So if you're not familiar with fixtures, these are pre-written scripts that you use to generate data for your database. And they're designed so that you can reset your database at any point in time in the project, and these will automatically bring your project back to a state where you can actually test it, you know, without you having to fill everything out. And so inside of PUP, which again is the boilerplate from Clever Beagle, and that's what I'm using to build command, inside of PUP, there's usage of a package uh, that I also wrote called Clever Beagle slash Cedar. So this package gives you a function called Cedar, which is designed to help you seed your database or create your fixtures that seed your database for you. And so what we'll notice is that uh, here we can see what we're ultimately working towards here. So I've got this count 500 and I'm saying Cedar, I wanna seed the cards collection with 500 cards in our, in our MongoDB collection. Um, so that's this, but just to walk us back toward how I got there, um, one of the things that I do when I restart the app or reseed the app is I have a products fixture. So this seeds the products collection with one product to test with. Uh, I seed it with one customer and I also have two users. So I have an admin user and then I just have like a regular customer user. And we can see that when both our admin user as well as our customer user are created, I have this thing called dependent data. So what this is doing is it's saying, okay, when you create the user or after you've created the user, go ahead and also create this dependent data for the user. So in this case, I need a Stripe customer that I can test with. I need a customer that I can test with. So customer object is separate inside of command. Uh, and then I need my product seed. So if we take a look at the product seed a little bit further up, there it is, we can notice that I'm doing the exact same thing here. So I create my one product, but then I have dependent data, which is running my card seed. And so that brings us back up to here, which is what we saw when we first opened this file. So we get 500 cards generated for every single product. So there's one product per user in this case, but um, 
So we're, we're getting you know roughly a thousand cards in our database. So you got to be careful with this. This isn't something you just want to kind of let loose, um, especially if you're going to push this code in production. So you'll notice that Cedar is allowed to have a, an environment list set. So in this case, I'm only doing this if I'm in development or staging. So you know worst case scenario, I'm not going to you know clog up a, a production database or anything like that. But you, you do want to remain aware of that. Um, but the, the, the long story short here is that I'm generating 500 cards for each user. So in my database, I'll have plenty of test data so that I don't have to muck around with trying to, to manually type out a bunch of stuff just so I can test a feature like this. So to dig into the actual implementation here, the first thing I wanted to do is point out how I actually load cards from the database onto the UI or into the UI. And so Technically speaking, if we go down to the bottom of this component, this is the product cards component. So product cards here is this UI that we see. So it's everything including the search and these buttons here as well as the list of cards. So all of that is the product cards component. And what I technically do by default, so meaning when this is loaded into the browser, loaded into memory, what I'm doing is I'm wrapping the products card component with a GraphQL higher order component. So this GraphQL higher order component is coming from the React Apollo package. So if we jump all the way up to the top here, we can see I'm importing GraphQL from React Apollo. Uh, and so what I'm doing with that is I'm saying, when this loads for the first time, go ahead and run the cards query. And so the cards query here, if I bring this back over, is this GraphQL query. So this is on the client side. This isn't the server side definition, this is client side. So what this is saying is, I wanna run a query called cards, which takes in a product ID, tells me which list I'm on, so either the open list or the closed list, um, the type of data that I'm filtering with, and all this other stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to this, but the point I'm trying to make is that what I'm doing is I'm running this query and I'm loading those cards onto the page, but uh, one of the things that I ran into early on with this, this component and with this feature is that I was having a lot of visual performance problems. Like the, the page was getting really jittery and it wasn't loading how I wanted it to. And that was because I was dependent on a direct connection to the database or literally running a GraphQL query in order to update the data on screen. And so what was happening is I would make a change, like I would change a filter, I would flip between my open or closed list, and I would have like a, you know, a few millisecond, a few hundred millisecond delay, I'd be like, eh, eh, and then stuff would show up. And so after a little bit of thinking, I realized like, well, duh, what you can do is put the cards onto state. And so that's what I'm doing now. And the way that I've approached that is I'm saying when the component first mounts onto the screen, what I want to do is call this this.setCardsOnState function. Now, this isn't built into React. This is something that I've written custom. Um, and what I do is when the component mounts, I pass this.props, and then inside of that function, setCardsOnState, again, this is custom, what I'm doing is I'm using the lodash.get method. So uh, this was taught to me by uh, a former mentor who used to work at Clever Beagle, Matt Michelle. Um, he pointed out this method to me and this thing is friggin' gold. So what this does is it says, given some object, try and get this property as a return value from that object. So from props, I wanna get props.data.cards. And if for some reason you can't get it or that data is not available, return some default value. So in this case, return an empty array. And so what this line is doing is it's saying, try to get the data.cards array off of props and then give that back to me as the cards uh, variable here. And then as soon as I have that, whether or not it's actually an array of cards, just some array value, I pop that back onto state. So that's one, and that's literally when the component mounts. Um, and so step two is, well, that data is gonna change. And it's gonna change in response to not only our infinite scroll, which we'll see in a little bit, but it's also gonna change in response to changing between the lists or changing my filters. And so I wanna make sure that when the component <clears throat> gets a new set of props, we update the state as well, or we update the cards on state as well. So you'll notice here, I'm saying component will receive props, and I use that same exact function again. So I'm saying this.setCardsOnState, 
and instead of this dot props, I'm passing next props. So quite literally, what are the cards or what is the data that's inbound to the component? Put that onto state. And so there's a smooth transition between whatever it was and whatever it's, or between whatever it was and whatever it's going to. Uh, so that's how my data exists inside of this component. So now that we've got our cards on the state, the next part that we need to dig into is actually handling the infinite scroll part or handling the scroll part of this. So something else that you'll notice here in component did mount is that I've added a call to this dot handle infinite scroll. And this is another custom function that I've added to the component. And if we look inside, what it's doing is it's looking at window dot add event listener and the scroll event. So what this is doing is it's literally adding a listener to the window and saying whenever the user scrolls, call this function. And if we look inside of that function, what it's doing is it's saying if, and I'll just kind of, there's a lot of gibberish here, but I'll explain this line is essentially saying if the user is at the bottom of the page, do this. That's the, the simplified version of that. The long form version of that is that this equation, I picked this up and I'll do this 100% in pretty much every single project is pick something off of uh, Stack Overflow. So um, I'm not immune to it. I don't know any programmer who's really immune to it um, unless they've been doing this for decades and decades and decades, um, like Douglas Crockford style JavaScript programmer. Um, so no harm in doing this. But the thing that I've done is this I know has been tested several times and through several projects and iterations. So this isn't just me spitting code out into um, a code base that I got offline. It's actually been tested and I actually thought through how it needs to work. So uh, that's a good tip to keep in mind just when you're building your own products is it's perfectly fine to take stuff from other people, especially if it's out there for free, um, but make sure to take your time and really test it. Don't just you know kind of like paste some junk into your app and then be surprised when it doesn't work or it breaks down later. You know, really take the time to, to finesse the details of it. So what this is doing is it's saying, if the user's current scroll position is greater than or equal to the bottom of the page, minus 400 pixels, fire this code. So literally run whatever's in this if statement. Uh, and so the reason I added that 400 buffer, so technically we don't need this. That's not something that is necessary. So this equation is going to find the bottom of the page where you tell you when the user has scrolled to the bottom of the page. But the reason I add the 400 is that there's this weird jarring effect visually that when you scroll to the bottom of a list, you're going to hit the bottom before the data loads. And so there's going to be a brief time when you're at the bottom, but there's no data being infinitely added to the list. So you kind of lose that effect of an actual infinite scroll where it just looks like things are magically appearing. Um, and so that negative 400 is saying when the user is within 400 pixels of the bottom of the screen, then go and fetch some data. So that actually gets us or affords us that infinite effect where the data is technically being fetched before they've really truly hit the bottom of the page. And so what we're trying to anticipate is by the time they've gotten to the bottom of the page, the data has been fetched and put onto screen so they don't know the difference. They just see, oh cool, data's just popping in. And so if we look inside of this if statement, what's going on here is I'm saying I want to set state of the current page value. Now this we need to rewind a little bit. So remember where we're at here. So what we're saying is when the user hits the bottom of the page or within 400 pixels, go ahead and set the current page to whatever it is on state plus one. Now that's where we gotta time out and kind of fill in the blanks on that. Like how did we get that? So what I've done is on my state, I set a default value for the current page. And what we want to remember is that infinite scroll is technically a form of pagination. So this is literally, uh, you know, if we have a list of things on a page and traditionally pagination is like, you get to the bottom, you see a list of numbers, like one, two, three, four. If you click on two, it goes to page two. Infinite scroll is no different than that. So it's not like we're, we're changing much of that convention. So we still need to keep track of like, well, where in the infinite scroll is the user at? And so that's what this number is doing. And what I'm doing by putting that on state is I'm creating a default. I'm saying I want to start at page one. 
And you'll also notice that I'm saying per page is 18. Um, that's mostly arbitrary, but there was some thought into it. So the reason I chose 18 is I've got my UI set up so that we have three cards across each row. So what this is getting us in essence is we get six rows worth of cards before we go and trigger um, that infinite scroll. So what I'm saying is current page is one, we want 18 items per page. So that keep that in mind. Now, before we go back to our infinite scroll code, all the way at the bottom of the page, you'll notice that on our initial query, so remember this is when our, our page first loads up, this code is gonna fire. What I do is I hard code again, so just like I did on state, I set the current page and the per page on the query that we're passing to GraphQL. So this is literally going to the database, and we'll see in a little bit what that means. But the idea here is that we're going to run this query when this loads, and we want to tell the, def the, the query on the server in the GraphQL server what is the default state of our list so that it doesn't get jarred or, or messed up. So with all of that in mind, what we're going to do is jump back up to our handle infinite scroll function here. And what we'll notice is I set the current page on state. So the current page when we're scrolling is always going to be whatever the current page number is plus one. So when I hit the bottom, I want to go to page two, or if I hit the bottom of page two, to page three, and so on. Um, and so what we're doing is we're updating that number first on state, and then I'm saying, and you'll notice here there's some funky stuff going on. So what I'm doing is I'm using the callback form of set state. And what that allows me to do is take in whatever the current value is on state for something, and modify it and then set it back on the state. So traditionally, um, a set state call is gonna look something like this. So I would say, uh, let's say current page, this dot state dot current page plus one. So this right here is identical to what I've written, but it's in a slightly more React friendly or purist way. So I'm just using the function form of setting state. So that allows me to take in whatever the current state value is here as an argument uh, to this function, and then I can return from that function what I want to update state with. So kind of a little you know, pro trick. Uh, so that's part one of this call. So you'll notice I'm saying set the state, but then I'm relying on set state's callback function to do some work after I've actually set that current page on state. And what I'm doing is I'm calling to this.props.data.refetch. And this data.refetch function, and more specifically this.props.data, is coming as a result of using this higher order component, this GraphQL higher order component. So quite literally, when we, we call this function and it, it wraps our component, behind the scenes what it's doing is it's not only fetching our data, but it's storing our data inside of a prop called data and passing that down to our component so that we can get access to the data that we just fetched. But, and this is a nice convenience, so again, this GraphQL higher order component comes from the React Apollo package. So this is a part of the Apollo GraphQL framework for working with GraphQL on the client side of your application. So internally, inside of that library, um, it's defined a bunch of helper functions for us. And so one of those helper functions is on the data object, they assign one called refetch, which, kind of like the name implies, is helping us to refetch the data that we set up the component with in the first place. And so this is super convenient in this case because we do want to refetch our cards list, but we have to change something. So you'll notice that here, when I call this.propsDataRefetch, what I'm doing is I'm passing these new variables. And this should look somewhat familiar. So if we kind of stare at that, for a few seconds, okay. And then we jump back down here to the bottom of our page. You'll notice that those variables match what I give to this query by default. So I'm saying run the cards query, but we wanna say get the cards for this product ID and pass these variables in. So we wanna say make sure the cards are open, um, set the current page to one. That's, so this is the default state of this query. And then when we get back up here, to our infinite scroll, there it is. What we're saying is, okay, we wanna refetch that data, so we're still relying on the same exact uh, product ID here, but now we wanna refetch it with some different variables in addition to that product ID. 
So here I'm able to say, okay, we still want to make sure that we're on the correct list, but you'll notice that instead of hard coding this to open, what I'm doing is I'm checking what is the active list on state. So that's literally, is this the closed list or is this the open list right here? Uh, and so that's set back onto state as this state active list. So I check that, but then I also check for our current page value, and I also check for our purge page value. So the reason I put this on state is mostly just for convenience sake, um, but if you were building your own UI, uh, I've seen some infinite scrolls where they allow the user to set how many items they want to see per page. So this is kind of affording that. That's not what I'm doing here, but you could do that if you wanted to. Uh, so that's what's happening here is I'm saying, okay, call to the server and refetch that data with these new arguments. So if we were on page two, this would be current page two per page 18. Uh, and so now what's going to happen, and this is just kind of the magic of React and all of these things kind of coming together. This is making life very easy for us as developers, is that even though this is all I'm doing, now you might expect like a callback function where I take the data we fetched and it's going to update it. What's awesome about this is I don't have to do that because of this higher order component down here, this GraphQL component. So what it's going to do is it's going to rerun the query and it's going to update the cache in the browser. So Apollo creates a cache for us in the browser with any data that we've already fetched. So it's kind of like a, a browser database. We don't really see it, but Apollo keeps track of it for us so that we don't have to constantly be refetching data if we don't need to. So it keeps a, a spare copy or a backup of whatever it already fetched, which is awesome. Um, and so by coincidence, I mean, it's actually intentional, but by coincidence here, um, what's neat about that is when I call this refetch function, what's happening is it's going to update that cache and then it's going to pass that result back to my component as a prop again. So again, as that data prop. And so if we go back up here, this component will receive prop step is designed to handle that event happening. So whenever we get a new list of data or we get a new response to our query from Apollo, that's going to pass through here. And that's because they're updating the data prop on our component. So our component is receiving the data prop. It's changing. And so because of that, I'm able to piggyback on that in set cards on state. And again, just like we saw at the start of this, we're just saying, okay, if there's an array of cards, just go ahead and update the state value with whatever you get back. And so that's super convenient in this case. Uh, and the reason why is that we really don't want to make our page jump. We don't want to say like, go fetch data and then load the next set of cards. We want it to be smooth. And so by relying on state, which remember is uh, React's way of having like a dynamic value, but it re-renders the component whenever that state changes. So as we're fetching new data, we're putting that data onto state and we're dynamically triggering a re-render. So for the user, this data is flowing in in real time. Even though it's not, visually it actually ends up doing that. And so now that we have this client side stuff all squared away, what we can do is go up to the server and take a look at, well, okay, we're, we're fetching this data or refetching data, but what does that exactly look like? So before we jump to the server real quick, I do want to point out um, what's going on on the client. So we'll notice that down here, I'm running this cards query. So we've, we've talked through this quite a bit. So this cards query variable that I've got here, if I jump back up to the top of my file, I've got cards as cards query being imported. So what I'm doing is I'm importing my query from another file. So this is in the queries cards.gql folder. And so if we jump over to that file, this is what we looked at a little bit earlier. So this is defining the query on the client. And so what I'm doing is I'm passing uh, quite a few variables to this thing, two of which are current page and per page. So earlier when we were looking at our infinite scroll function, handle infinite scroll, we passed current page and per page. And so one of the conventions of GraphQL is that we have to tell it what we're doing very explicitly. So in this case, I'm explicitly stating that for the cards query, which again is what I'm loading down at the bottom of the, the component, I'm saying for the cards query, I want to be able to support two arguments. I want to be able to support current page and per page, both of which are integers or just 
numbers without decimal places. Another way to think about that. Um, so what I'm saying is those are possible values and I'm going to take in those possible values, those possible arguments, and I'm going to pass them to our actual GraphQL query. So this query is defining the query on the client. It's kind of like our wrapper function. And this code right here is actually the query. This is the field as far as GraphQL is concerned that we're querying against. And so what I'm doing is I'm relaying those two variables, current page and per page, right along. You'll notice the dollar sign syntax is defining the variable. And then this is us passing that variable to the actual query. Uh, and so you'll notice that these do not have exclamation points, which means they're optional. They don't have to be there. Uh, whereas I need to know if there's a product ID and whether or not the list is open or not. So that's what that's, that's up to. Uh, so this is defining this on the client side, but now what we need to do is go to the server. So what I'm gonna do is open up the API file. So this is in, I'm in the startup server api.js file, and this is just like pop. I haven't, I haven't changed any of the major structure here. Uh, and what we're going to notice is inside of what's known as the root query. So your root query in GraphQL is where you define all of the fields that you can actually query against uh, in your GraphQL server. Your GraphQL schema is the more proper term for it. Uh, so in your GraphQL schema, you can query these fields. And the one field we want to look at is cards. So what we're doing here is we're telling GraphQL what to expect. So we're saying that, okay, it's possible that somebody is going to query this cards field. So we want to set the expectation for GraphQL that, hey, cards might be requested. And in addition to that, what we're doing is we're, again, we're specifying what are the exact arguments that this query is going to support, or rather this field that we're querying is going to support. And so we'll notice that on here, just like we had on the client, we've got current page and per page added. Again as integers and again not required. And so this query already existed, this was written a while back, but this I just added you know, for, for this Feature Friday video. So these have been added in addition to these other four, but the idea here is that whatever we define here on the server has to match what we define here on the client. Otherwise we'll get a bunch of errors and we won't get data and we'll, you know, we'll just cry ourselves into a stupor or whatever, <laughs> whatever developers do when they're at their, their wit's end. Uh, so that's part one on the server. So we've got our, our field that we're querying against and we've got our variables that we're querying against or that we're passing to perform our query with. Uh, but the other part of this and the actual code that's going to perform the work of our query, which is known as our resolver function, is defined in this file. Now, this is a bunch of different queries or resolvers. So just to make sure this is clear, we'll notice that we've got cards here and we are going to dig into this, so don't worry about that. Uh, but we've got our cards query, we've got a card, so just one card by itself query, and I've got a whole bunch of other, you know, really granular stuff in here for different reasons. Uh, and we'll notice that those same names, like version cards, roadmap cards, card version, all that jazz, are also defined here. So you can't forget that. You've got to define your, uh, your fields first on your root query in your schema, and then you have to define the resolver functions for those queries. So literally, we have to write the function that's going to resolve the query. So that's why they're called resolver functions. And so if we jump back up here for the cards resolver function or resolver query resolver function, bleh, too many words, man. Um, the <laughs> cards query resolver. Um, most of this is irrelevant to us right now. So just to give a quick kind of overview of what this is doing, this is making sure that the current user is allowed to see these cards um, and it's also handling all of the logic for filtering. So inside of the UI here, I have this filter menu and you can say, oh, I only want to see features or I only want to see bugs or refactors because I slipped. Uh, or bugs. Um, that's what that's doing. So all of that logic, let's go back so I don't confuse myself here, um, all of this logic is handling that. So it's updating the query based on what filters the user selects. So that is irrelevant to us. Um, the only thing we care about, and this is what's remarkable about this, is for something that seems like it should be complex, it's not, is this limit property right here. So 
what we're doing at the bottom of this, and this by bottom of this I mean the bottom of our resolver function. So we're returning a value from our resolver function. So literally this is what we're trying to resolve our query with. What I'm saying here is that in the cards collection we want to find the cards matching our query and query is just the compiled result of all the different rules that we have based on what the user has filtered the list on. Um, so once we find those cards, what we want to do is we want to limit that list. And so what this limit is achieving, this is kind of sneaky, um, and dare I'd, I would even say it's, it's not the most performant, depending on how much data you're dealing with. So just kind of a, a little bit of foreshadowing, I'll probably revisit this later, but in terms of a simple infinite scroll implementation, this is, this is killer. Uh, so what's happening here is we're saying find these cards based on this query but then only limit the number of cards that we get back and this is the sneaky part. So remember we're passing current page and per page as arguments or what are referred to as args inside of your query resolver function. So if you're going through the GraphQL documentation or a lot of examples online um, including stuff that I've published you'll notice that the, the arguments for your function, and this is where this gets frustrating, are parent, args, and context. So all three of these are referred to as arguments being passed to your, your query resolver, but args is literally the args that are passed to the query when it's made from the client. So don't let that confuse you. Uh, so back down here, we're loading in our current page and our per page, but what we'll notice is we're saying, we only want to send back the number of cards equal to the current page times per page. Um, and this is where I start to embarrass myself. So <laughs> the, the, the default version of this, so when we're on page one, is going to be 18. So one times 18. The next time, so two times 18, so we get 36. And then what is it? Oh, so send me hate mail, 54, and then I think it's... Uh, what is it, like 72, something like that. I know, I know, I know. Um, I'm terrible at math. Uh, the important part, though, is that I got it to work, so that's what matters. Uh, so what this is doing is it's saying for each iteration of current page, we just want to fetch that page number times the number of cards we want per page. So in this case, every time back here in the client that we call this refetch, Remember that we're incrementing our current page number. So we're saying one, two, three, each time that the user gets to the bottom of our page, or in our case, within 400 pixels of the bottom of the page. So as we're incrementing that number, we're now refetching the data. So this value here is ultimately making its way back to our query right here. So each time we make our request, we're saying, okay, give us a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more. Um, and so this is the, the, the thing I was mentioned a little bit ago is the performance problem here. So if you're dealing with a massive list of data, eventually this is going to bog down. Initially it's not. And that, that deserves some clarification. So the thing to keep in mind is that every time we make a request, we're sending back another group of cards. And, I'm, and I'm, I almost said chunk there, but that's not true. So what we're not doing is going and fetching the next chunk or the next page entirely. We're saying give us all of the cards up to the bottom of this page. So literally 18, 36, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> 18, 36, it's pretty bad, right? Uh, I can't do basic math. Uh, but 18, 36, blah, 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 blah. We're, we're increasing that number as the user scrolls down our page. So literally each time they hit the bottom, we're sending back a bigger and bigger chunk. And so literally in our browser, and we can probably see this at play. I didn't test it too much. Um, but what we'll see is if I scroll, the first few of these notice they're, they're pretty seamless. I can't tell that I'm waiting, but now you'll see, see how it's kind of taken a second? That's because this isn't the most performant way to do this. Uh, the most performant way would honestly take me quite a bit of time to, to really put together. So we're not going to do that in this video, but I may come back to this in a future video just as kind of like a revisit to show you how I clean this up. Um, but this is, this is the point I'm making. So we'll notice that it's all pretty smooth. And let's refresh just so we get a clear picture here. So it's pretty smooth 
up until, what are we, we're probably like 100 or 200 items deep in the list, and then it starts to get a little bit clunky. Um, it's still not terrible, it's not bad, but you'll notice that it has that clunk, and that's because back here in the code, what we're saying is keep that list ever expanding until it hits the, the, the max amount that it can return to us. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, but the cool part is, is that that's pretty much all you need for infinite scroll. So uh, even though this isn't perfect, and I probably will take it a little bit further, um, and again, I'll, I'll probably do a revisit just so you can see what my solution is later. Uh, I can't really say when that's going to be, but I will do that at some point. Um, but uh, that is the basics of infinite scroll. So to kind of wrap up here and review, um, what we're doing is we're saying when our user scrolls, and when they hit the bottom of the page, keep track of the current page, and each time they hit the bottom, change that number, increment it by one, so increment the page by one, and then refetch the data saying, here's the current page and how many we want per page. And then just multiply that number, increasing how many you get back. And then the other trick, and this is just for the visual consistency, so again, let's give this one more refresh here. Let's see if we can let you see it. So notice for the first few hundred items, it's, it's pretty smooth. You don't really notice the jarring or anything like that. And so that is because we're using state. So remember that I'm loading all of my data onto state when the component loads, as well as whenever the data changes. So I'm rewriting state. And so taking advantage of React's super fast performance in this case um, is allowing us to, to get that nice visual uh, smoothness of moving down the list. Uh, so that's it. That is infinite scroll, at least a simple version of it. Uh, so that is going to do it for this week's Feature Friday. Uh, really appreciate you guys watching these, and I do appreciate the feedback. So a lot of you have been getting in touch and saying, hey, I really like this, or I've really been enjoying these, or these are super helpful. So thank you for that. Keep that up, because that does kind of encourage me. Uh, but also tell me what you want to see. So eventually, I will probably run out of stuff to, uh, to uh, teach you here, or at least I, I'll think that I have. Um, so please, um, send, me, send me emails. Uh, you can send stuff to ryan.glover at cleverbeagle.com, and I'll pop that up down at the bottom here and leave it in the notes for you. Uh, or just send me a tweet. Uh, say it's uh, at CLVRBGL on Twitter. So some uh, Satanist has decided to uh, placehold Clever Beagle, the actual spell out name. Uh, so it's at C-L-V-R-B-G-L on Twitter. But just send me a tweet, and I'd be happy to, uh, to, to hear you out uh, and see if it's something I, I think I can teach you folks how to build. Uh, so with that, uh, I am going to let you go. So signing off for the HMS Beagle. We'll see you next week, folks. You just listened to me run my mouth for the better part of an hour about a bunch of really technical code. So... Why not commemorate that experience by watching another tutorial and having an absolute psychological meltdown? Cool.